You can open it to Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 19. Amen. We are excited about next Sunday, that missions emphasis that we're going to be having. And I decided in prayer this week, as the Lord directed me, that I also needed to share on uh, the subject of missions today. And so I want to be talking to you on the subject, has Jesus rescinded the Great Commission? Well, the obvious answer to that is no, right? How many of you know God's Word does not change, right? What Jesus told His church to do does not change. Now, what has changed is the spiritual and the political climate. Unfortunately, today there are many people in our world who call themselves Christians who they don't give anything to the work of the Lord. They live their life in such a way that, that uh, they're not, it's, it's like they're, they're not concerned with spiritual things. They're only concerned with the temporal things of this world. Okay, that has changed. And also, how many of you realize that the political climate of our world has changed? How many of you know the devil does not want you talking about Jesus anywhere? Right? He wants you to be quiet. He wants you to be a silent Christian, a quiet Christian. Do I have anybody that says you're not going to abide by that? Because Jesus has not rescinded the Great Commission. You know, today in our world, in many workplaces, it's not culturally acceptable to challenge people about the gospel. I mean, after all, we wouldn't want to quote-unquote offend anyone. We wouldn't want to tell anyone of another religion that their religion is, is in error, that it's wrong. And, and many people today see their beliefs in Christ as something that's personal, not to be shared with anyone else. And, and there's this idea that all religions are somehow the same. And the idea is that that it doesn't matter what you believe or what you practice as long as you are sincere you're going to be okay uh, how many of you know that's just not true come on that is not true we must get the gospel out how many of you know the gospel is what is true the gospel is what is right amen the gospel is what is good and uh, the good news is that the penalty for sin has been paid. There is a righteousness that is received by faith, and heaven is available to all who believes. If you're grateful to Jesus today, can we just give him a big hand of praise today? Come on. Amen. Amen. God is so good. The Great Commission has not changed. Jesus has not rescinded his marching orders through the church. You can write this down today if you're taking notes. This generation of believers is responsible for this generation of lost people. Stop and think about that for just a moment. You and I face the same question that generation after generation of believers have faced, and that is this question. Are we willing to become involved in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only here at home, but around the world? I pray today that you will leave here with a greater and a fuller understanding of the Great Commission and your part in it. So open your Bibles with me to what is known in Christian circles as the Great Commission, okay? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. And uh, these are the words of Jesus, right? They're in red. These are the last words that Jesus said to his church before he ascended into heaven. He said this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Excuse me for just a moment. Amen. Sorry about that today. All right. That, my friend, is what we call the Great Commission. How many of you are still with me today? All right. I know what some of you might be thinking. You know, this part of the Bible here, it really doesn't pertain to me because, you see, the important thing is that the missionaries who God calls, that they go. 
right? How many of you remember a few weeks ago or months ago, we had some missionaries here, and they shared of their life and their passion and their burden. And a lot of people read this, and they think, you know, uh, this verse in the Bible, this is for them. This is about them. How many of you realize that that is really a false assumption that many people have? This verse is about you and me. This was Jesus' last words to his church. Uh, these are the marching orders for the church. And I just wonder today, does anybody here know anyone who does not know Christ? Who knows someone who doesn't know Christ? Who's not following the Lord, right? Maybe where you work, the restaurant you eat at, the block where you live. Maybe even in your own family. Well, then and let me tell you something. We've got a burden and a responsibility to do our best to share Jesus Christ with them. Let me tell you something. Nobody gets a pass on the Great Commission. Come on. In fact, did you know that this is not called the Great Suggestion? And we certainly don't want to stand before Christ and have him tell us, Church, this was in your life was the Great omission the thing that you forgot because this was the very thing that Christ ordained for the church to do and the Great Commission is also found in Mark chapter 16 where he said this he said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature how many of you realize if you preach to every creature you're probably gonna get every person I won't be honest with you I preached to a few creatures in my life in Colombia, I was out in a, in, a, in a village one time preaching the gospel in a little, in a little, little house church, maybe 35 people there. And I'm telling you, a hog came to church. It was the most, I'm not talking about a little pig, but I'm talking about a giant hog came to church. He walked right down the middle aisle. He sat right by the front row. He cocked his head like this. And the whole time I was preaching, he was listening to me. So I preached to a few creatures in my life. I preached to some iguanas. When we had a crusade, one time there was a donkey right over here. It was an outdoor crusade, and the guy kept his donkey there the whole time. It was like that donkey was saying, Amen. Get him, Pastor Bob. I'm just telling you, we got to take the gospel to the world. Well, I want to ask you three questions today, all right? Uh, number one, here's these are important questions. Why did Jesus give the Great Commission? Let me just give you the answer up front today. Here, you can write it down, because all of mankind is lost and separated from God unless they know Jesus. The Bible teaches that you and I, all of our planet, was born into the world as part of a fallen race. Every human on this planet since Adam has been born underneath the dominion of sin. And through one man, the Bible says, through one man, through Adam, sin entered the human race. And the only way anyone can go to heaven is through the person of Jesus Christ. How many of you believe he's the one and only way? Come on. Jesus is the one and only way. John 14 and verse 6 says this. Jesus' words once again. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then notice this next phrase. It says, no one comes to the Father. God the Father except through me. I'm telling you today, you cannot get through to God, through Buddha, through Krishna, through Muhammad, or any other person. Only one person is the mediator between God and man, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. The scripture goes on to say this, Acts 4.12. It says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is an exclusivity to the gospel. Jesus is the only name that gives salvation. And Jesus gave the church the Great Commission because he's a lover of mankind. He loved man so much that he died for mankind kind on the cross and God wants for as many people to be saved as possible that's why he declares in 2nd Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9 that he's so long suffering toward us this is what he says the last part of that verse he says that God is not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance if you want to understand the heart of God if you want to know what a, that type of heart is it's a heart that loves humanity it's a heart that cares and he has provided a way to, for mankind to be reconciled back to God through his son Jesus Christ is there anybody today that's grateful for salvation come on are you grateful for salvation 
So if you consider this fact, all right, this fact that all mankind is lost and separated from God and its ramifications, it has, it means that, that millions, no, 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 not millions, billions today on our planet are away from God. Entire cultures, people groups, entire cities are without God, alienated from the only hope that there is, and that hope is Jesus. Number two, here's the second question today. This is a biblical question, by the way. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? This is a question that's found directly in the Word of God. Uh, the greatest theologians in the world will tell you that this is the most difficult concept for any believer in Jesus Christ to put their arms around, to wrap their head around, to understand completely and fully. A lot of people just reject it completely because they don't want to believe what the Word of God says. How many of you want the, uh, the, the, the truth this morning? Let me tell you something. If you want a church that does not preach the entire Word of God, you found the wrong place today because we do not dilute the Word of God. Come on. Amen. I, I want to preach the whole truth and nothing but the truth, the whole book. And I realize I'm picking this verse up in the middle uh, 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 of the verse, but I want us to focus on the question. It's found in 1 Peter 4 and verse 17. All right, it's a Bible question. He says, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and sinner? That's a powerful question. What happens to those who don't obey the gospel? What happens to these people groups who've never heard? What, what becomes of the ungodly? What will become of the sinner? And let's make it more personal this morning. Come on. What happens to our friends and our family who laugh at the very thought of going to church and serving God? What happens to those who've never heard of Jesus? What happens to those who refuse to repent and continue on in their sinful lifestyle? What happens to those who reject the gospel? What will their final destiny be? I want to answer a biblical question with a biblical answer today. You can write these words down. And they're powerful words. Sad words in a way, but true words. What happens? What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? The truth is that they will perish in an eternity without God. They will perish in an eternity without God. Revelation chapter 20 tells us this. It says this. This is the biblical answer to a biblical question. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Now, how many of you know that the Bible tells us that there is none righteous? No, not even one. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it goes on to say this, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. My friend, the only way your name can be found written in the book of life is when you accept and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. You say, well, pastor, won't there be another opportunity given? Let me tell you, I wish I could preach that. I would love to teach that. But no place in Scripture does it say that an opportunity is given after death. It plainly says, if one's name is not found written in the book of life, he is thrown or she is thrown into the lake of fire. My friend, I believe that there's a real heaven and a real hell. Come on, somebody. I said, there's a real heaven and there's a real hell. And I know that there's a lot of people today who are trying to say that the lake of fire, oh, that's something that's just figurative, that's out there. Don't you believe it, my friend? It's not figurative, it's true, and it's real. Another teaching says, well, the lost people, they will just be annihilated. I don't believe that either because why does it say that their soul will be in torment forever and ever? It uses the word everlasting. I can sure that it is all, I assure you, 
it, that, that the Word of God is very real. And I know that it's uncomfortable for Americans to think about these things. It's unpleasant on a beautiful spring morning like we have today here in Houston, Texas. It's not preached in most churches today. But I'm here today to tell you that Jesus talks more about hell than he did about heaven.